Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah left a legacy that is difficult to grasp in a single lecture. Authored no less than 50 books in his life, references core texts in their field, an authority rahimahullah. And when he passed away, they looked at the number of pages that he'd authored all throughout his life and they divided it by the number of days that he lived and they found that on average Imam al-Nawawi was authoring about four small booklets every single day. How is that possible? You will say to me, I say to you, don't ask me. Ask al-Nawawi rahimahullah himself who said there were two particular years in my life where I did not put my side to the ground in sleep. Meaning he sat on a table like this with his books stacked up and he's reading, writing, authoring, memorizing, producing. And then when he feels overwhelmed by fatigue, he blows out his candlelight and he puts his head on a book and he sleeps. And then he wakes up again and he continues. He said, two years I didn't sleep on my side. And when one of his friends came to visit him by the name of Badruddin ibn Jama'ah, he said, I found no place to sit in his home. There was books everywhere. So when I would come to his house, he lived in a minaret. Very humble life. Must have been like a circular room of some sort. He said, I'd come into the room and he'd make space from the books just to give me a place to sit and talk to him, rahimahullah. These are the aspirations of our men and women. And then Imam al-Tabari, rahimahullah, the author of the famous tafsir, and you probably have a copy of it on your phone. And when we say tafsir interpretation of the Quran, that is the go-to text. They looked at his life, al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, he said, for the last 40 years of his life, he was authoring 40 pages a day. And do the maths, that brings you 584,000 pages of knowledge that he'd authored. And the tafsir that you have now was supposed to be 10 times bigger, but it was the low aspirations of his students that caused him to change his mind. He said to his students, do you have energy for us to study tafsir of the whole Quran together? They said, yeah, how long would it be? He said, it will be about 30,000 pages. They said, we will die before this is completed. So he summarized his tafsir that we have today into 3,000 pages only. And then he said to them, do you have the energy for us to study history from the time of Adam, the first man, till our time today? They said, how many pages? He said, about the same, 30,000 inshallah. They said, we will die before this is completed. He said, aspirations have died. Where are your aspirations? Where are your ambitions? And so to make it easier for his students, he summarized it into again 3,000 pages and that's the history book of Tariq al-Tabari that we have today as well. And Ibn al-Jawzi, Abu al-Faraj, you hear of him. He said, with my two fingers, I have written no less than 2,000 volumes worth of work. And he said, Alhamdulillah, 100,000 Muslims have found their way back to their religion through me. He said, Alhamdulillah, 20,000 Jews and Christians have taken their shahada through me. And he said, if I was to say that I have read 20,000 volumes of work, I wouldn't be exaggerating and I am still reading till this day. And when he passed away, he had a will, which is to gather all of the pencil sharpenings that he'd used to write. And he said, please use those pencil sharpenings to heat up the water that you will use to wash my corpse after I've passed away. Pencil sharpenings. And they gathered all of the pencil sharpenings into a huge heap. And that became the fuel to heat up the water. After he passed away, his body was washed, shrouded and buried, and there was still pencil sharpenings remaining. This is our history. The biggest book in history was authored by our scholars, Ibn Aqil al-Hanbali. He authored a book called Al-Funun in 800 volumes. I think there's maybe one or two copies of it in the world because which printing press is going to print 800 volumes of one book? Phenomenal book. And he wasn't a full-time sheikh, by the way. He had a wife. He was a qadi, a judge. He was a dad, subhanAllah, a husband. Allah placed barakah in his time and he made the right decisions because of his aspirations. Two pairs of shoes, he said, one at the front of the door and one at the back of the house so that I never have to waste time looking for shoes. And he said he chose to drink his food as opposed to eat it because eating food takes more time than drinking it. Several of our scholars did this, by the way. Some scholars, they would eat very dry bread because that's all they had next to the river to dip it into the river and eat it. Dawood the tai would drink his food as opposed to chewing bread. So he would break it up and put it into to a drink of some sort and drink it. He said, the time difference between drinking my food as opposed to chewing bread is the time that I could use for the recitation of 50 verses of the Quran. I'm not saying to you, do the exact things that they did. That's not necessarily required, but take from the essence of what they did, the high aspirations. Ask yourself, why am I different to them? Why don't I feel the same level of urgency that they felt? What's different? Shu'bah, Ibn al-Hajjaj, the scholar of Hadith, he says, the only two types of people who we would see running in the streets were the insane people or the students of hadith because the students of hadith did not want to even waste time walking from place to place they would run ibn taymiyyah rahimahullah speaks of his grandfather who said that when my grandfather would go into the bathroom to respond to the call of nature he would give me a book and he would say to him read please and raise your voice so that i can hear what you say so that even those moments he spends in the bathroom he is learning something subhanallah 
Razi who would have 10 pencils sharpened for him at a time. And he would write and write and write and write until one of them would go blunt. And then he would write and write and write and his family would be sharpening the other pencils for him. There's no one to waste time sharpening. And if he needs to sharpen a pencil, they would see him sharpening and he's moving his lips. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, Subhanallah. Why? To make use every second is in the glorification of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Urgency and high aspirations. And that's why Imam Malik, he said, nobody will attain true knowledge until you taste the meaning of poverty. And Imam Malik himself spent all of his money in pursuit of knowledge when he was a young man till he needed to sell the roof of his house. Imam al-Bukhari, they came into his house one day and he'd been missing. They'd attended the halaqat of hadith with one another and Bukhari was not there. Two or three days, where is he? We don't know. This was narrated by a peer of his, Umar ibn Hafs al-Ashqar, his name was. So we went to the house of Imam Bukhari, we knocked on the door and he is completely nude, naked. He'd sold his very last item of clothes so that he could finance his pursuit for hadith. So he said, we gathered some dirhams for him, some money, and we bought him some clothes. Yahya ibn Ma'in, the friend of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, his father passed down one million dirhams. He was a rich man, and he spent every one of those dirhams in the pursuit for knowledge till he needed to sell his sandals and he would walk around without shoes. La ilaha illallah. So where are your aspirations, my dear brother, my dear sister, from the likes of these examples? Imam al-Bukhari, rahimahullah, who would wake up on numerous occasions throughout the night because of an idea that came to his mind, a fa'idah, a benefit in knowledge, and he would write it down, and he would sleep again then he would wake up again with a thought so he would light his lantern and he would write it and then blow out the light and go back to sleep and he would do that on average 20 times a night their aspirations did not give them the opportunity to rest. We ask the question now, what are the ways of fostering high aspirations? How do we go about cultivating high ambitions if you feel it is lacking in your life? I'm going to suggest five quick steps. First of them is by creating a sense of urgency in your life. One who knows Allah Almighty will know that he deserves to be glorified and worshipped and thanked. And time is not to be wasted when you are under his watchful eye. Al-Rabi ibn Khuthaym, he would exhaust himself in the ibadah, the worship of Allah. They say to him, why do you tie yourself like this he said because I want it to rest because I don't want it to fatigue anymore I want it to rest in Jannah that's number one create a sense of urgency number two identify your areas of interest in your life where is your passion I'm not saying to you identify what you're good at that's really not that important because we know people who are very good at certain things but because they were not passionate about it it became their weakness they didn't do anything with it not every Muslim is required to shake the pulpit on a Friday in a khutbah not every Muslim is required to author books not every Muslim is required to memorize hadith not every Muslim is required to dedicate his life, her life to charitable causes. That's not everyone's vision in life as a believer. You have to identify what interests you, what you want to specialize in, and then direct it in the cause of religion. Ubay ibn Ka'b, his mastery was Quran. And when the Prophet ﷺ would make a mistake when leading the Muslims, he would say, where is Ka'b? Why didn't you correct me? Abu Huraira, his field is Hadith, the number one prolific narrator of Hadith. That was his interest. Ibn Abbas, tafsir of the Quran, the exegete of the Ummah, Khalid ibn Walid, none of that. It was jihad in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two. Number three, articulate a vision in your life. In fact, this is key for your lofty aspirations. To have a vision in your life. Think about it, articulate it, write it down, test it against your friends, and print it and put it in a place where you can see it. This is my vision in life. This will define the next 50 years of my life. One statement. Can you do that? There was a woman by the name of Helen Keller who died in 1968. And she lost her sight and her hearing during her infancy because of a bout with illness that she had. And she said something profound. She said, the only thing that is worse than being blind is having sight without vision. What is your vision? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us an example in the Quran between a Muslim who has a vision and another who has no vision. Allah said, Is the one who walks flat on his face, fallen on his face, is he better guided? Is he like the one who walks upright upon a clear path? In other words, is the one who has a vision like the one who has no vision? Identify a vision. Then after that, you need to have some goals to help you get to that vision. So if you imagine it's like a pyramid, it's a vision statement at the top, and then you have goals in the middle that take you to the vision, then you have daily action plans that take you to the goals, which take you to the vision. Those goals that you will identify for yourself, let them be SMART goals. SMART is an acronym for five words. So your goal has to be specific, has to be measurable, has to be attainable, has to be relevant, and it has to be time bound. What was the first letter of the acronym? S, which is specific. Your goal has to be specific. So you can't say my goal is to be healthy or my goal is to be happy. Or, my goal is to be successful. Be specific. It's good to start with a vague goal. That's fine. But sooner or later, you will need to choose which aspect of life you want to specialize in. Your aspect of your dunya that you want to excel in to serve the religion. Specific. What is number two? It has to be measurable. So there has to be a way to quantify the success of your goal, whether you've achieved it or not. So you will ask 
ask yourself questions like how many, how much, you need a number, if you can, so it has to be measurable. And then what was the third? It has to be, it has to be attainable. Because if you put for yourself an unattainable goal, it becomes more demotivating than it is motivating. And then what was the fourth? It has to be relevant to you. So for example, a young man or who has parents who are say disabled and they need his care. And then he says, my goal in life is to be a pilot. I'm going to be a globe trotter, right? I'm going to go around the world and spend weeks and months away from my family. That's not relevant because who's going to take care of your parents? It's going to be relevant to your values, your principles, as well as a Muslim. So all of those lives that you are seeing on YouTube being promoted, mansions, cribs, palaces, fame, and you say, my goal in life is to be famous. Yeah, we say, okay, that's a goal, but is it relevant to your principles as a Muslim, your values? Does that help you enter Jannah? Not really. It's got to be relevant. And what was the last one? T, which is time bound. When are you going to achieve it? So you need a vision and you need a set of smart goals. Because if you have a wonderful vision, but you've got no smart goal, then you've got this amazing idea, but you've got no way of getting there. And similarly, you may have goals, but no vision. What are you doing with no vision? It just means that you're wandering in life, sleepwalking, achieving one checklist, fulfilling another checklist, but you're not actually progressing towards a grand vision. So we said, how do we foster ambition? By creating a sense of urgency, by finding your areas of interest, by finding a vision. Number four, very quickly, by finding a mentor, a human being, a person, a friend, a family member who you associate with, who gives you a sense of possibility. It can be done. And that is the purpose of the stories of the prophets in the Quran, to remind the Prophet Sallallahu that what you've been tasked to do is possible. There's others who've achieved it, inshallah. And number five, to ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala for high aspirations. وَأَسْأَلُكَ الْعَزِيمَةَ عَلَى الرُّشْدِ Oh Allah, I ask you to give me determination to do what is good. أَعُوذُ بِكَ مِنَ الْحَجْزِ وَالْكَسْرِ Oh Allah, protect me from incapacity and laziness. Always realize, as Stephen Covey, he said, your most important work is the work that is ahead of you. It's never the work that's behind you. There is always something to be done. Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, the intelligent people from every nation are unanimously agreed that joy cannot be attained with joy. And whoever opts for comfort has missed out on comfort. And depending on your willingness to live in difficulty and strain will determine the pleasure that you will experience in the hereafter after death. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to live with high aspirations.